2017-18 budget present? No. Special board meeting for April 26, 2017 at 7 17. Here's Ryan. Here. Karen Dylan. Here. Barbara McInnes. Please notice. Robert Brett. Tim Spadoni. Here. Caroline Dudley. Here. Patty was it? Here. Can I say the Pledge of Allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I'd like to, well, first review, you did public comments, so I didn't actually look at that very closely. Uh, public comments would be first. Public comments first? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, anybody has, anybody on the list for public comments? No. Okay. No public comments. Thank you. All right. So then we'll start with number three, new business. Um, we will, with A, we'd like to review and discuss the 2017-18 budget. I will kick it immediately to Mr. Prince, who has uh, a presentation. Can I just say something right Certainly. before that? I just want to thank everyone, actually, who had part of this, um, because it was extremely detailed. It was put in layman's terms, I think, for at least for me. I mean, I really thoroughly understood it, and it was extremely thorough. So I just want to thank anyone or everyone who gathered data, put it together with the pie chart, with everything. It was just, I thought it was really perfect. So, thank you. Okay, so um, you've all had the uh, the binder uh, since uh, since Monday to take a look at. I put together a slideshow to uh, step us through the budget. Um, the first slide talks about the methodology we use. Uh, we basically use a service-driven model to, uh, to build the budget. Uh, what that means is we look at the types of services that the library provides, uh, the, types of, uh, uh, the types of physical layout that we have that generates uh, the number of desks that we have to uh, uh, demand or, uh, or person, as the case may be. Uh, in order to uh, function on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, live up to the uh, library's mission. Um, you know, you could make a case that we should do a plus or ten, plus ten percent or minus ten percent approach to budgeting, which some places do. Um, but you know, if if we just uh, take that approach, you know, we run uh, we run the case or we run the risk of uh, missing some large items. So what we try to do is, you know, basically start with zero and figure out what we need. Uh, software expenses is a good example. You know, so we know that we have software that takes care of uh, uh, the back end of our business, if you will, the, uh, uh, the ILS. Um, do we have the book do we, you know, as a customer or a patron in good standing and so forth? We know that we have to have that in order to function. So yes, you know, we, we have to have uh, uh, money in the budget for that. We have to have money, money in the budget for the various uh, applications that uh, our patrons expect. You know, to run the uh, machines downstairs to provide copies and, and uh, so on and so forth. So, what we do is we build up, you know, from zero as we identify those things which uh, uh, which are important to the customers and the functioning of the library. Um, we also look at um, uh, we also look at uh, uh, aspirational things in that budget, things that you know, things that we plan to buy. Um, Communico is is a good example. You voted on Communico last week, um, so you know that's something that would be in the budget. Um, and and the reason that we do that is because with software expenses in particular, we have a lot of uh, products that are on various uh, renewal cycles. Some renew over two years, some renew over in in one case over five years. And uh, if we're just taking last year and adding ten or subtracting ten percent. 
um, then you know then it's then it's uh, problematic because we're not actually capturing the, the real business of the library. Program ex expenses are are another uh, item, another example. Uh, we, we look at anticipated programs over the next fiscal period and try to attach a cost to them so that we can uh, uh, represent them accurately in the budget. Uh, can we decrease stuff by 10 percent? Sure, absolutely. But if if you're going to decrease costs by 10 percent, that means what we have to do is decrease the services. Uh, actually, probably decrease the services by more than 10 percent because there are certain things such as uh, the maintenance of the building, for example. The maintenance of the building has to happen whether we're doing all of the services that we're budgeting for or 10 percent or 50 percent or whatever. So, you know, those expenses continue regardless of the service level unless you, unless you mothball the building in its entirety. Um, and I don't think that that's something that the board or anybody is interested in doing. So let's start with revenue. Uh, biggest change in revenue is uh, uh, due to the increase in property tax allocation for the special revenue funds. Well, if you remember over the last several years, we've had this group of funds called special revenue funds, and we've had a large balance in the aggregate in these funds. Uh, when I first started about four years ago, three and a half years ago, that uh, fund balance was about $1.1 million. So what we've done is we've worked very hard to drive that balance as close to zero as possible. You might ask why. And the reason is, any money that is uh, put into a special revenue fund can only be used for that specific purpose. So it does us no good to have $300,000 in fund balance in the, uh, in the audit fund, for example, because the audit only costs us about $15,000 a year. So if we had $300,000 of fund balance in there, we'd have something like 20 years of, uh, of uh, audits that, you know, that have already been paid for. Can we use it for payroll? Can we use it for books? No, we could only use it for audits. So our strategy was to drive it as low as possible. What's happened in the last year is that our building and site fund has gone to zero. As a matter of fact, we'll end up with a deficit at the close of this fiscal year. And what we have to start doing is allocating property taxes to that to cover the deficit and to, and to bring it back up. If we take away uh, from the property tax line of the general fund, special revenue funds, that goes up. And uh, the general fund uh, uh, goes down, uh, as you can see on, on the chart. Um, some of the other changes, um, there was an overall reduction of property tax revenue by $81,000 because we were trying to match the county records as closely as, as possible. We had an estimate in there of, uh, last year of $6.8 million and it was actually lower. Um, the, we uh, are reducing fine revenue by $25,000, basically in half, because uh, we moved uh, as a policy to adopt auto renewals of, of materials that were in patrons' hands. Uh, we increased the investment income in the budget by $20,000. Um, and then the last two line items, we established a, a book sale revenue line to recognize uh, those flows as well as a uh, passport revenue line to recognize flows from, uh, from passports uh, when we get that up and running. Moving, and I want to say that, you know, what, what I'm trying to do is, is kind of follow the uh, financial statements that we, uh, uh, as we present them to the, you know, to the board. So this is a summary of the uh, general fund expenditures, and then we'll go through each one uh, individually. But, it, you know, it's interesting if you put, you know, if you put uh, last year's budget against this year's budget, and you look at the, uh, uh, the major classes of expenditures, what you see is that there's an overall uh, difference, uh, actually uh, uh, an increase uh, of all the uh, general fund expenditures by $706,000. And that's actually uh, driven by uh, an increase in salaries of 196, almost $200,000, and uh, an increase in employee fringe benefits of uh, nearly $500,000. And, and as I said, we'll, we'll get into uh, 
into the puts and takes of that in a moment. Uh, other changes uh, year over year are, uh, are nominal. Let's look at salaries. Okay, so the salary budget was constructed assuming a 3% annual raise. 3% uh, annual raise equates to about $48,000, which is approximate, approximately uh, $16,000 per percentage point. So said another way, if you, if you decided to raise salaries by only 1%, it would be $16,000, or 2% would be 32, and of course, what we've modeled is 3% here. Um, the numbers that you're looking at also include uh, implementation of the Cook County minimum wage. Uh, we uh, added about $25,000 uh, to the budget to, uh, to account for that. And just to review quickly, starting on July 1st, um, the uh, Cook County minimum wage will be $10 an hour. And then we'll increase a dollar per, uh, per hour in, um, over the next uh, three years beyond that. And it'll terminate at $13 an hour in uh, 2020. Uh, also, uh, there's new hires that are planned, about $89,000, including uh, $10,000 for passports, if necessary. Uh, if you remember from uh, last uh, board meeting, there was um, a write-up that showed that uh, there's a potential cost of $10,000 to handle all the passports that we're planning on, which is 1000 a year. Uh, also included is the full year impact of the prior year's raises and new hires, which is 33,996. And then the last bit of information I wanted to uh, put in this, on this slide was the uh, change in CPI from March 2016 to March 2017. It's plus 2.1%. And as a matter of fact, the uh, state of Illinois has uh, put out plus 2.1% as the real estate tax uh, increase limit. Uh, under uh, under state law for this uh, for this upcoming uh, levy cycle, we look at library materials. Library, library mater uh, materials have increased to keep pace with the overall uh, change in the budget. Uh, according to uh, standards set by the industry, uh, quote good libraries unquote spend 12 percent of their overall budget on library materials, and seven about 762,100 dollars represents exactly. Uh, uh, 12%. Looking at, uh, sorry for the uh, for the print being so small, but if you're following along on, on the handouts, uh, uh, I hope you can uh, you can uh, see these all right. Uh, looking at library operating expenses, those are the expenses that are associated with uh, delivering services uh, uh, to the uh, patrons of the library. Uh, the notable changes here. Uh, total, total about twenty-three thousand uh, dollars. There's an increase in library supplies, reflected reflecting changes in how we present certain parts of the collection. Um, for example, uh, uh, we just made a change recently where we're keeping the uh, newest games, video games, video games uh, that can be checked out behind the uh, desk because we were having uh, an issue with uh, with theft uh, that we're trying to mm -hmm. combat. So. That, what that necessitates is uh, buying new sleeves and labels and, and think, you know, bins and things of that nature to, uh, uh, to make sure that, you know, that that is done uh, appropriately. Um, uh, we had a decrease in software licenses reflecting uh, the schedule of renewals. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, we just didn't have the need for uh, 80 plus thousand dollars of uh, money in that particular line item because the renewals and, and the expansions, uh, such as Communico, that we anticipate totaled something less than that. Um, also, uh, we had an increase in uh, programming, uh, reflecting the acquisition of uh, the baseball exhibit coming in um, in spring next year and uh, Comic Con, uh, which uh, which is coming uh, later this later this year in August uh, of this uh, of this year. General administrative uh, expenses. Um, again, I, I apologize for the uh, uh, for the vision test on the, on the screen. Um, okay, so these types of expenses uh, cover the uh, general administrative, uh, uh, the back offices, you know, where uh, 
uh, Susan and I and uh, Cindy set uh, also include a lot of the marketing activities and, and uh, things of, uh, of that nature. Um, some of the maintenance activities, some of the IT uh, activities. Notable changes here uh, are an increase in professional development. Uh, 2018 is a, uh, a public library association convention year, uh, which tends to drive the costs uh, up. And if you look back over uh, multiple cycles uh, going back, you can see that every year is a, lot, is a big year uh, for professional development because it is a PLA year. Uh, and then we had uh, significant decreases in consulting and legal fees. Uh, the the uh, consulting fees were high in the previous year because of uh, strategic planning and a couple of other things that we did. Uh, we're not doing strategic planning uh, again. We're completing it uh, this cycle so that so that we could uh, start implementing it. Uh, there's also an increase in promotional, uh, reflecting uh, some of the expenditure of the book sale proceeds to you know fund the start of. Uh, uh, library store, things that have logos, uh, items that have lo our logo on it so that it's open to the public and they can carry them around in the, uh, uh, in the community. And there's also a, a decrease in office supplies, but overall it increased uh, year over a uh, year of about uh, $31,000. If we look at uh, fringe benefits, uh, fringe benefits are nearly $500,000 greater than last year's. Uh, uh, budget. Uh, this is due to a one-time payment to IMRF of approximately half a million dollars that uh, we expect to make um, should the board agree to it, um, that we expect to make during the year. Um, I have more on that later, so uh, let's not panic. Uh, group health has been estimated upon, uh, based upon an employee census and a projected 4.4 percent increase in uh, insurance costs. Um, I have preliminary numbers, but the uh, actual expenses will be finalized uh, shortly and will be presented in May for your, uh, uh, for your approval. The HRA, the uh, Health Reimbursement Account, and dental are library programs. And it's, diff it's really difficult to estimate usage, uh, but you know we try to estimate high enough that we capture all of the costs that are going into it. We can't really curtail usage if we have a plan out there that's that's operating. It's, it's uh, each employee's uh, right to uh, exercise their rights under under these programs. And then um, the last uh, item, uh, life, uh, long-term disability, accidental death and dismemberment, and short-term disability. Um, is an item that is actually uh, provided by IMRF after we've been in the plan for one year. So we'll actually be under that plan uh, beginning on August 1st, 2017. The benefits, however, under the plan are less than what we currently have. And we're exploring um, complementary policies that would you know, take us uh, in combination to something closer to, uh, you know, to what we have. So you know, something like an all sources uh, policy that would uh, uh, that would not over reimburse an employee, but would take into consideration the fact that they would be getting money from the IMRF. The other thing to consider here is that new employees who start with the library um, and that have no prior IMRF uh, experience would not receive insurance coverage uh, for these items until their one year anniversary. So we have to figure out how to cover them as well. So a little bit more about IMRF. Um, as forecasted prior to the adoption, uh, IMRF started with an unfunded liability of nearly $900,000 on the day of adoption. So what that, what that means is, is that um, immediately, IMRF was accounting for 20% of all eligible employees' service uh, uh, going towards their retirement or their vesting schedule uh, uh, toward their retirement. And that added up to a, a 900,000. This was actuar actuary actuarially determined. Um, this added up to a $900,000 unfunded liability. 
The employees, if you remember, all had, eligible employees, I should say, all had an opportunity to purchase the balance of their past service. And uh, we also had information, and that was presented to the board, that the unfunded liability, if all eligible employees bought all of their past service, would go to 3.6 million. It was like 3.661 or something like that. So um, a significant number of employees did exercise their right and buy past service. And the liability uh, settled at approximately two and a half million dollars. Okay, the signif significance of an unfunded liability is that over time it increases the library's contribution rate. Okay, so the current contribution rate that we've been paying since uh, August of, of uh, 2016 is 8.12 percent, and would have risen to 13.54 percent if no payments were made to pay down the unfunded liability. The board, however, in December of 2016, decided to pay $2 million to IMRF to basically avoid paying any additional interest costs associated with the liability. So the way an unfunded liability works is, is, is that it's sort of like a mortgage. And you pay a large amount every month. And uh, in the beginning, a lot of a lot of that goes to paying interest associated with your liability, in this case the unfunded liability, and a small amount goes to paying down the actual liability itself. And uh, I believe it's a 20 or 25 year uh, vesting schedule so that at the end of 25 years um, you're even. Okay. Um, so what, what the uh, what the IMRF does is it accrues interest at 7.5%, which is their target, and paying the $2 million, therefore, avoided the annual payment of $150,000 in interest. Um, looking at the next point, you can see the impact of the library's contribution rate effective January 1st, 2018, is 7.31%. That 7.31% is 0.44 tenths of a percent lower than the current rate. It, that doesn't add up to $150,000 though. What you have to do is look at the difference between the 12.54% and the 7.31%, and that's where you find the savings of $150,000. Uh, as it turns out, the library still has an unfunded liability of $500,000, which is budgeted to be paid uh, during 2017-18. Um, of course, with your approval. Um, that payment will help us avoid another $37,500 in interest for a total of $187,500 savings annually. So, you know, said, said in English, uh, we can expect our rate to go down uh, further for January 1st, 2019, unless IMRF uh, doesn't make their earnings, which you know, which would be an upward pressure on our uh, on our rate. But just holding everything constant and looking at the unfunded liability, we should see a decrease in in uh, in the next cycle as well. So here's some numbers again, another uh, another vision test. Uh, last month we paid nineteen thousand twenty dollars. Um, and that was the library's contribution to uh, IMRF on behalf of the eligible employees at 8.12%. If we took that number and we turned it into a number that represented 13.54%, the uh, total would be $31,716. Um, and then if we took that 1920-020 again, and we turned it into something that represented 7.31%. Uh, that would be $17,123. The difference between the 13.54 and the 7.31 is 14,593, so call it 14.6. And then if you annualize that, just multiply it by 12, it looks like the real savings is somewhere in the neighborhood of $175,000. And the whole illustration is based on March's monthly payroll of 234, 236. Um, 
Now here's the cautionary uh, part of it. The actual savings is going to depend on the fluctuations in the actual payroll uh, during the appropriate fiscal period being measured. So, you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes we have uh, months that we pay five weeks instead of four weeks. Those payrolls are a little bit higher. So we may see slightly higher numbers, or we may see an expansion in the payroll or a contraction in the payroll because of hiring or uh, uh, attrition uh, activities, and that would cause that number to fluctuate as well. But this is a ballpark estimate, and as pretty, you know, as pretty close as estimates go to the $150,000 savings that we projected uh, that we would uh, capture on the $2 million. Uh, contribution. So what else? Uh, we have um, a bunch of funds called special revenue funds. And those special revenue funds, you can read down the left hand side there, they cover our audit and a lot of insurance, like the liability insurance we pay, um, uh, the social security taxes uh, that we pay, workers compensation, and unemployment compensation, and then Building in sight. Uh, building in sight is is the uh, particular fund that has run dry and has run a deficit this year. So uh, we need to get more money in there. But you can see that you know building in sight runs about two hundred thirty four thousand dollars last year, two hundred twelve thousand dollars this year. So it's down a little bit, uh, but it includes you know things like the uh, HVAC system and and uh, cleaning the library and cutting the grass and pruning the trees and you know all the things that you know you think about in terms of uh, just think about your house you know a lot of the things that you do to your house have to be done to the library as well um, this year we have uh, a big caulking project where you know we have to go around and, and re caulk all the all the windows and all the joints to you know make sure that the building is uh, preserved in this uh, and it's watertight. So uh, the first bullet point there uh, reiterates uh, the point that I made earlier that special revenue funds are levied for special purposes and may only be used for those special purposes. Um, a lot of these numbers are awaiting final con confirmation from vendors, but um, I would be surprised if they changed uh, too much. The one that will change a little bit uh, more than the others will be workers' compensation because we did have a couple of claims uh, this past year and, and, uh, and everybody knows if you have claims on an insurance policy it tends to make the, uh, make the uh, uh, insurance premiums go higher. And then of course uh, we talked about uh, building in site a moment ago. Uh, we also have a fund called the Special Reserve Fund. And the Special Reserve Fund is where the library transfers money to fund significant repairs and improvements to the, you know, to the facility. So if you read down the list, you know, we have some you know, digital services equipment, IT upgrades. Uh, we're contemplating reconfiguring the, uh, uh, the data center. Uh, bathroom renovations we've been talking about. Uh, signage uh, we've been talking about. We have uh, some um, uh, big expenses with uh, parking lot lights and poles that need to be addressed. Um, uh, actually uh, repainting the building uh, and uh, doing some work to the entrance canopy as well as the pavers under the canopy. Uh, we're also looking at uh, resurfacing the uh, the parking lot. That you know, We do that, what, Dave, every four years or something like that? Um, and then uh, we're contemplating looking at a uh, and a new phone system for the library. The library's phone system is, what would you say, Rich, is every? Year six. Year six, but we're, we're yeah. like way behind on it. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, not to be alarmed by any of this because uh, anything that's spent out of the special reserve fund takes a special approval process that the board has to approve everything that comes out of that fund specifically, so each one of these things will be presented for your consideration at, at a later date, but you know, we, we can view these uh, numbers primarily as uh, placeholders for some of the large things that we're taking a look at. Uh, one thing that I, I will point out is I believe that the signage number is a little, uh, 
underrepresented. I think um, the latest version that you saw at the last board meeting was 120,000. Mm -hmm. So, but the, you know, the point is, you know, we were in that exercise, we were trying to put together something that gave us an estimate, something that we could uh, use the specs for uh, for bidding purposes. And uh, if it comes in a little bit higher or a little bit lower, you know, the board has an opportunity to review that and uh, approve it or piecemeal it or however they want to approach it. So um, I wanted to put this slide in because um, there's a couple of uh, you know things that you know we've uh, we've put in the budget that you know really need uh, your advising consent on. Uh, in particular, uh, the anticip anticipated raise program, which we put in at 3%. Um, you may feel it's too high or too low, um, or you may want to um, uh, disaggregate it into a couple of pieces so that, you know, so that uh, we have uh, an opportunity for some merit. Um, and then discussion and guidance uh, and the additional funds to eliminate the remaining uh, unfunded liability with IMRF, which if you remember is a half million dollars that um, is a half million dollar expenditure that, uh, that we put into the budget. And that's it. Thank you. Follow um, shot ties and just start a discussion. Just try not to bring up other things that people have already talked about, just for time sense, um, or or at least things that were answered. Um, so, Karen, do you want to go first? Um, then? I have a couple questions yeah. if that's okay. Uh, Greg, I just wanted to direct your attention to the slide that begins 2017 to 18 annual revenue. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned here overall reduction in property tax revenue by about $81,000. Is that just because our collection rates were not as high as we had hoped they would be? Is, is no, that what I'm looking at? Um, at the time, I had used an estimate of $6.8 million. And then, you know, once the county did all of their work, it turned out to be a little bit lower. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's what's, what's behind that. So we wanted to sync to what the county had said. Okay. All right. Um, Next. The, um, page on your slide that began 2017 expense summary. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to match that up with a book that we got earlier in the week. So I'm looking at page B1 and comparing this. So your budget uh, for 17-18 of 6.332 million. I see that matched up to the general fund amount midway through the page on B1, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So last year our um, our actual, our actual for 2016-2017 was at about 7.3 million in terms of what we spent. And I presume that's primarily due to that uh, 2 million we spent for IMRF, yes, which, which couldn't have been anticipated before the year. But fortunately, we had some of the savings that we could take out mm -hmm. the money mm -hmm. and, and pay that down. That's correct. Um, I know that we actually talked about, briefly talked about paying off the entire amount last year, 2.5 million but due to the effect our appropriation wasn't that high we we could only pay two million last year so i i look at paying off our IMR, imrf liability sort of paying off your mortgage as soon as you can to mm -hmm. save interest um would it if we paid the remaining five million off as soon as possible the five hundred i'm sorry five hundred point five million uh five hundred thousand if we paid that off early in the year as opposed to later in the year, would we save additional interest by doing that? Uh, actually, no, actually not. Okay. Um, the way that IMRF uh, accounts for things is December 31st is a very big date in, um, uh, in their parlance. Uh, what happens is you only get credit if the money is in by 1231. If it's in by, let's say, July 1st, uh -huh. You get no more credit than if you put it in on December 31st. Okay, good to know. So, so but we would definitely want to get it in by December 31st. Yeah, right. and, and last right? year, uh, this past year, what we did was I think we got it in around the uh, 16th or so, uh, just to make sure that we had a couple of, of uh, a couple of weeks just in case, you know, they couldn't find it or, or something like that. It was, you know, 
you want to be safe. Okay. All right. Fine. Um, I, I have a couple more questions. I don't want to monopolize the discussion. No, it's fine. Oh, me. Okay. Just, just All right. Before. Okay. Yes. Um, in terms of the um, minimum wage increase, um, I don't know if Niles is going to opt out. Um, maybe our mayor knows, um, but he's not saying one way or the other. I think you have to be home rule. Um, Niles is home rule, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Definitely. So it could opt out. Uh, I don't know that Niles has taken any action with respect to opting out of the minimum wage uh, law imposed by Cook County. So if not, we need to comply with the minimum wage law going into effect. And um, I had a question about what was said on page three under minimum wage increase. And um, Greg, I, maybe I'm, Susan, maybe you're the one to answer this. I'm not sure what you mean when you say we plan by the end of the budget year to compress the grade seven and six positions. Uh, what, what would you mean by that? Well, I mean, How would that work in terms yeah. of the minimum wage increase? Right. Um, well, grade seven is our, our shelters, and that's the only people in that grade. And then grade six has a number of different positions in it. So we would be uh, basically eliminating the grade seven position altogether, and we would be having um, all of the patron services, clerical staff, and shelving staff have flexible duties so that they would be, uh, we would probably develop a sort of tiered system of clerks within that one range, but kind of squishing together grade six and grade seven into one. So there would be no more sevens, they'd all be six, they move up to that grade. Would there be extra expectations imposed on those people in terms of the duties that yeah, they'd be well, able I'm to Probably for almost all of them. I'm not sure it would be possible for 100% of them, but for almost all of them, we would be giving them extra duties. Okay, all right, great. Um, again, just cut me off if I'm mm -hmm. too answer. All right, page four. Before you leave page yeah. three, I want to point out something. Um, in the uh, paragraph in the middle, the minimum wage increase paragraph, about four lines down, it cites a number 11,200. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, when uh, Susan and I were working on this, I calculated a hard number based upon our current staffing and what the staffing models look like today, and what the difference in the in the in the cost is to take a certain group of people and raise them to ten dollars uh, comes out at eleven thousand two hundred dollars. Now. Um, one thing I can tell you about plans and budgets is that once you strike them, once you put them into operation, people start quitting. People, you know, start, you know, doing things that you didn't anticipate in, in the four corners of the budget document. So, uh, uh, if we have a number of people that decide to leave, okay, we need to have those services covered anyway. So what we'll do is we'll call on anybody that has the available hours to step up and cover those services. So in the budgeting, in the actual numbers, I put in $25,000. Now we may only spend, you know, the, the lower number, 11200 Or we may actually, um, no, we, we may only spend that. But I wanted to provide for the possibility in case operationally things change to such a degree that we're required to use some of those people more than what their approved hours are to cover the services that are vacated by anybody that decides to leave or gets promoted or you know okay. like. so right. you're saying you'd use a higher paying staff member mm -hmm. to do a lower paying uh, staff opposite. member staff opposite so um so if you earn eight dollars and fifty cents mm -hmm. an hour and i uh and i earn eleven dollars and fifty cents um, you're raised to ten dollars, okay? Now you may only be working ten hours a week, and I may be working twenty-five hours a week. I get promoted, or I quit, or I leave the library in some way, shape, or form. And Athena, who is in charge of patron services, says, Carolyn, instead of ten hours a week, I need you to work twenty-five hours a week because I need you to cover part of direct hours. Well, you are only authorized to work ten hours a week. So now I have to, in the budget, account for the raise to ten dollars for an additional 15, 15 hours a week. So what it is is someone making more money will be doing the work of someone who was making less, and that's why you added twenty-five thousand. Just the opposite. 
Somebody well, made, why did you add twenty five thousand? Why did you have to add more money to the budget? It's the same difference if I'm working eight if I make eight dollars an hour and instead of working ten hours I work twenty five hours, it's still an increase. So there's an increase because of the hours, but it's still absorbed by what someone else would have been making. So because what I would what I would seek to do is to hire is to hire somebody to re we would seek to hire somebody to, to replace my hours, but in the meantime, you're working you're working at uh, uh, plus a dollar fifty an hour so, so, well, for a big for a longer yeah okay, for a I longer see. period of time. Right. It's just in case. I mean, okay. you know, I well, you know, it's I, a small I mean, amount. I thought we were going to have a twenty dollar person working for a ten dollar because you're in a jam. Yeah. And I would think maybe we could rethink that. Okay. Oh, that's fine. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, uh, that's okay. Um, I think I just one more in relatively small question about page B2. And I just noticed that uh, our grants, the amounts we're getting in the grants, uh, appears to be going down, and it shows none for this year. But I do think we are getting some grants, but maybe it just doesn't show up in this line uh, on page B2 where it says grants other. So maybe the, I don't know why that line is going down so much. I was just wondering. I mean, it's not a huge amount of money, but I was sort of wondering why there's nothing coming in there. Well, we did just get uh, $1,000 the other day from uh, private bank. You probably saw the picture in your Facebook feed if you, if you Facebook that. Um, you know, so there is, you know, there is uh, some money uh, there to be accounted for, but, you know, in the uh, April period as opposed to prior. There was at one time somebody whose job it was to be writing grant proposals, mm -hmm. um, and she has been gone for quite a while, but we used to put a little bit more effort into that, and a, a variety of money can come in under that heading, but recently we have not been getting very much money that way. We've been getting the Dollar General grant occasionally, and, you know, we do put in for some grants, but, you know, you, you just really don't ever know when you're going to get them. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things um, to consider is that we've uh, put in for uh, e rates? No, that's without comment or no, that's, that? uh, that's with Uncle Sam. And if you remember, we upgraded our wireless access in, in the uh, uh, in the building, and the total cost was oh, yeah, right. almost forty thousand dollars, and they picked up about eighty percent. So it cost us about eight thousand dollars out of pocket. But that was, you know, that was net. You know, we only paid eight thousand dollars. We never had the money coming, and the, the money from the government actually went to the suppliers. I see. So it didn't show up as something we received. Right now, now the uh, other part of E-rate has to do with communications. So um, internet costs, for example, uh, will be reimbursed uh, sixty uh, at sixty percent, uh, which might end up being uh, in the neighborhood of uh, eight to ten thousand dollars. That most likely won't come until after the end of the year, but we'll we'll make provision for it as a receivable list and when we're able to calculate it. Great. Then you're saying right, thank you. I'm sorry. You're saying communications that also will cover the phone expenses you were saying uh, you get coming up also? Yeah, uh, the phone expenses are, are, are going away. It's it's more the internet connectivity okay. uh, that they focus on. So the new phone system doesn't cover, isn't covered in the e at all? Uh, we don't know. Well, we would try. Okay. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, if there's something that looks like Any it's close. Any break is better than no break. Yeah. yeah. Any more uh, phone systems are uh, our data systems anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't I don't know the rules well, uh, well enough, and I think Rich is break, breaking a sweat because each one of these is, oh a, is a tremendous <laughs> amount of work, uh, but it's well worth it. I mean, it really pays Watch off, me. and it's and it's his you know blood, sweat, and tears that uh, you know that actually got us uh, to a point where we can get this money. And if you remember, uh, the board decided. Uh, to um, filter for pornography, mm -hmm. okay, which is you know which is the precursor to actually being uh, qualified to uh, apply for these funds. So I can't remember when that exactly is. Maybe a year or so ago or two years ago, the board decided to put filters in so that uh, patrons couldn't 
look at inappropriate things on, on their computers or on our computers. And uh, E-rate is very specific. You have to have this in place in order to qualify to get any money from them. Mm. So, you know, in case you were wondering why we didn't get this before, you know, that's, that's the answer. That's it, thank you. And just to piggyback on one of your questions, Karen, uh, with the grants other, the one right above it is that per capita grant, the one that we do receive. So that's one where I know we're always talking about just in case it just says per capita first. Tim? Um, if you have any questions. So I'm a little confused as to where the IMRF unfunded liability, 500,000, is in the budget detail. Okay, so if you look, uh, I'll tell you where exactly, Tim. Let's go into the B pages. Mm -hmm. And if you look on uh, uh, page B6. The top of the page. If you you know if you read along, it's just deferred compensation. Um, but you know under the old deferred compensa compensation scheme, you got 160, 176, 180, 190, 195, 168, 163. We budgeted 250 last year, but it looks like we'll be like 200, uh, 2 million to 23, and then this year is 735. Yeah, I see. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, essentially, uh, on page B1, bottom line here, uh, we are, this particular budget is operating a deficit of 342000 for this year. Yes, now there's, you know, two, um, uh, obviously that's incorporating that 500000 Yeah, and, and it's also incorporating the 548000 that we that we're uh, planning to to spend in the uh, special reserve. So when you look at the, you know the, the deficit of 342.054, that is in all sources and right. that's you know that's everything. Right. Everything, everything, everything. Right. When you start break, breaking it up into funds, it starts to look a little bit different. So for example, special revenue funds, mm -hmm. they never have revenue because the board decides to put money into the special revenue fund, and then the board decides to spend it. And as the board decides to spend it, you know, that those balances are drawn down. Currently there's about 1.55, I think, uh, of uh, 1.55 million in the special uh, revenue, uh, special reserve, excuse me. Um, and so this will draw down a lot of these projects, most of these projects were already in okay. uh, the special reserve, um, you know. But you know, we, we try to take a look at it periodically. Mm -hmm. We know eventually we're going to need a roof. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. One of my questions: When do we anticipate that we're going to need a roof? Eight to ten, I think. From year from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope the answer. Repairs in the meantime. Yeah. Let them worry <laughs> about it, Hunter. You know. So. You know, um, you know, we look at it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to share it off? Are we going to lay another rubber down? down? Or how much do we have to do with repairs? And then we try to keep pace with it uh, to uh, arrest any leaks or uh, any uh, other places where it's compromised. So a special revenue fund every year we put in so that we can anticipate those? Uh, I, I believe the last time we put money in was two years ago. Uh, we put in one point two million dollars. Okay. Um, so yeah. we're not putting in. I understand. We're not putting in. We're, we're just taking on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it affects the. You know, it makes the deficit sure. look worse. Right. On a on a global basis, but you know, really, when you spread it out from an accounting perspective, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you, you kind of have to pull your specials out. Right. Okay. Um, one minor thing. So we, we talked about the PLA. Um, Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, do we as trustees, we should talk about it as trustees, if we're, we're not increasing that line item for us at all, 
from last year. We didn't use very much, but if we all think that we're going to go to that, if the staff is looking to go to that, maybe we should discuss that. I can't remember what the plan on that is. I think it was only 4000 that we had in the it's, it's on page B5, and trustee expense is a little more than halfway down the page. Okay, and there's 4000 uh, and that's a very good question. I don't know. Uh, I think that probably the people teaching in schools would not be able to do that, but um, because it's during the week rather than some of the conferences being more on the weekend or the summer. But certainly we could find out from each of you who think you were going to go and adjust. When is that again? I don't remember. I don't have it's an April. It's, it's an April thing. Oh, okay. It's either late March or early April, depending. It seems like it was not that. No, I can't remember. But this is the one that is really more appropriate for it's us. Very targeted. Targeted. I mean, it's the, this is the one that's probably best for us in terms of the information we've got there. Yeah, it's just the, if it's during the week and not on a weekend. Right. And not during, sometimes it's during spring break. If it's during the spring break. It's landed there before, but. Well, that's the only way I could PLA, possibly deal with it. Thank you. PLA is March 20th to the 24th in Philadelphia. Thank you. That's before our spring break. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, just throwing that out there, yeah. you know, I, I had gone to one time and I found it usually not for sure. So, uh, you know, I, I thought that was a, a worthwhile thing. Well, we're lucky that ALA is here actually this year, so right. it's a, that's a big plus. Um, I haven't had all that opportunity to look at them since Monday. Um, do I have any other questions? That was it for me. Uh, yeah, so that I, I back to that. I am a rough on the uh, It's either a pay now or pay later. Yeah, it's like pay now or pay, pay, pay later, pay later, pay right. later, pay later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. yeah, okay. are covered at 20 plus hours. I didn't realize it was that low. It's a thousand hours uh, per year. Right. Uh, right. And if you do the math, it's 19.23 uh, hours is the uh, is the break point. Right. So but the point I was trying to make is I know we're increasing part-time employees and you know the purpose of like I, I mentioned this once before, two years ago we had a buyout, and the purpose of the buyout was to keep our salaries low, and we said that we would be replacing people to come into the library after that buyout at part time. And we're certainly still doing that, but if at 20 hours we have to pay for IMRF at 8.5%, which hopefully is going to drop in January, that's pretty hefty, so I was trying to figure out at ten dollars an hour, and it'll be thirteen dollars an hour in a few years. Plus, we're giving them eight. We're paying eight and a half percent for IMRF. What grade level, or what what positions fall under this level that we would be paying that much for them? They shall books. What else did you say? I mean, what? I mean, just to so go back to the IMRF part, we mm -hmm. uh, almost never hire anybody at over twenty hours anymore. We try to keep that number under twenty hours frankly, so we don't have to pay IMRF. So, but it, we were already considering the person for passports that you would be paying benefits. Some benefits, sure. So we, how vacation, uh, we're, we're talking about vacation time and things like that. I mean, so they get sick time, they get a number of other things. And, and that's actually another point, too. To be part-time 20 hours or whatever it is, plus you get vacation, then you get IMRF. I think what we're not noticing is how costly a part-timer is becoming. And I don't know if it's benefiting the library to have part-timers at this much of a rate when you consider all the full-timers you already have. Now, I will admit this was a very detailed report, and I appreciate it. I mean, the binders, all the, the different um, breakdowns. But with what we didn't receive is I would love to know what each department is doing on their own, how they're functioning, how their year was, in terms of 
staffing and their programming. I don't know half of these um, department heads. And I don't really know how I could make a judgment call as far as increasing our budget or not when we don't have the details. I mean, this is pretty general. But what I need to figure out in terms of how many full-time employees we have and part-time employees, I don't even really understand how they're being utilized in the library. So I was wondering if maybe we could get a little more specific information, like what's happening in children's or what's happening in adult services before we decide that we need to even hire. I think you plan on hiring even more people, but we don't have an idea of what's going on in the library to be assured if maybe we could do some moving around or maybe we should rethink some of these positions because we never have that information. And most budgets usually include that. It. it gives us a lot more to digest and then maybe be able to make a better decision, especially when we're looking at vacation days and um, sick days for part-time. Well, I mean, the alternative to part-time is full-time, which you know, but it's always a until we higher can see, benefit package. Until we can understand what the utilization is, it's kind of hard to tell. But then the other thing is, you mentioned to us that, is it your supervisors or your department heads, or same thing, librarians, um, they get about 50 days off a year, and um, that's what all the days we give them. So then we need to realize we have to fill those days while they're off. I mean, we're just, it's like a skyrocketing HR line item. And I don't know if we've ever really looked at it. Well, if you recall last year, I did come to the board and try to reduce the number of personal days for the staff, because that was my concern. But my, and it's not as much to do with personal days. It's what does the staffing at the library consist of? What are our heavier departments? I mean, what's going on? during the day or in the evening. Oh, well, um, I, I was looking at your book beginning on page four, where you detail exactly what each department does. So that sort of told me what each department does, page four to page Yeah, I read that as well. Nine. And then, Carolyn, you asked for uh, organizational charts. I'm glad you did, because well, um, we did get this, and I thought this was pretty useful. I had to print it out on three pieces of paper, so it's a little hard to read. But there it is. And so it tells us exactly how many full-time and part-time people are in each department and their names and everything, which is really nice because then when you talk about people, it's a little easier for me to figure out, oh yeah, I know who that person is, I know where he or she works. So when I looked at this, I was actually just sort of surprised how, we, how heavy we are with part-timers and really how relatively few people we have who are full-time employees. Now, what, what it doesn't tell me is when, when someone's part-time, exactly how many hours they work. So I can't figure that out necessarily, but I know they're something less than full-time. And so I, I thought this was very useful in terms of showing me exactly how many people were in each department, exactly how many were full-time, how many part-time, and, and then combined with this discussion in the book as to what they do, I thought that was very helpful in terms of what uh, how many people are in each department? And, and well, I'll agree. The do. information that I requested would have been helpful had I been able to open it, but I couldn't. I sent you an email about that, but that's besides the point. But then the second part of the information would have been the cost per department for each of those employees. So we can get an idea of what it actually costs us to run the, these departments, knowing this part-timer makes X number of dollars, this full-time person makes that much money. It would be a much better idea. I did read the job descriptions. I think they probably weren't as detailed as they could be because there were like four items that uh, someone at a higher end salary would be doing during the day and I'm sure they're doing more than that. So I did read those job descriptions as well. Um, but I was more concerned about the staffing in the departments and the cost. But if I could get the cost, that would be great. If I can just say something, I mean, there was another piece in here, and I don't know what page, but there's so many pages. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, when I was reading it too, just you had said like how many people it takes just to run the four floors of the library during the opening hours. So I mean, that really helped me just kind of envision and think, holy cow, we really need, you know, just quite a few people here just when we open up the doors. Yeah. 
um, and make sure that there's someone on each one of those floors to make sure that it's maintained and that it's staffed. So that was a really strong statement for me. Um, again, I think for hiring a director, we still have to let her focus on the staffing. We, she always talks about how she looks at job details. She's always talking about how she is trying to um, give one person multiple different types of duties so that people can go. We have been talking about that for actually probably four or five years now so that they can multi-purpose different tasks. We've been working on and really been moving forward to, with that. So I think with what you, you're asking is, is a little bit micromanaging and we have to really just focus and let her do her job. Well, and back to my question. Oh, thank oh, you. No, go ahead. But, okay. but I mean, back to my question. Um, in, in most places, when you review a budget, the information I'm requesting is not out of the ordinary. I'm not micromanaging her job, but as an elected official responsible for this budget, we should be able to know exactly what it costs us to run those departments. And in terms of some of this wonderful um, job sharing or whatever we've decided to do, I mean, to see that in writing would also be fabulous. Because that would get, give us a better idea to figure out why there are so many part-time people in this department when we realize maybe they're actually working in two departments, who knows. But I still think that information is valuable and I'd love to have the cost associated with those departments as well in terms of their staffing. Because that was one concern of mine. But then back to IMRF, um, I had a question about the fact that initially when we talked about the cost and we weren't really sure where it was going to end up, but it was going to end up at 3.6 if everyone bought back their time. I remember <coughs> the point was if somebody should retire, that would change some figures as well. Now, was that before we paid off $2 million or now when people retire, is there an increase in what we need to pay? So what, um, uh, what IMRF does on retirement is they take a look at the individual's um, uh, demographics. Uh, are you male? Are you female? How old are you? Uh, are you married? Are you not married? Etc. Mm -hmm. And um, what they, and, and of course, they look at salary level and so forth to establish a benefit. And then they look, then they go to mortality tables and they say that this person is going to live 10 right. years, five I'm, years. I'm familiar with the process because oh, okay. I work with IMRF. I'm just trying, I don't know the answer to when somebody retires, does it affect? our payment to uh, IMRF. No. It doesn't. So once they determine what this person's retirement is, our $19,000 per month will not change. Well, if they retire, they'll come off the rolls and, it'll, and that amount will go down. So we will not be funding their retirement? No, we do fund their retirement. And how do we do that if it comes off the rolls? Where do we so, see that? As I was saying, they actuarially determine how long this person is going to live and they go to mortality tables. And then they look at how much money they need to support that person for that period of time and they discount it by 7.5%. Do you understand discounting? So yes, so then Good. how do we know? So they discount it by 7.5% and they come to an amount. Right. Maybe that amount is $50,000. Then they look into our reserve account and they take that $50,000 out of the reserve account and they put it into the IMRF retiree account. And that money, uh, and it's the only time that they grab the money from our account, that money is preserved for that person to pay their retirement okay. until they no longer have to pay that retirement. The unfunded liability or uh, uh, if it's not an unfunded, I guess the funded liability, uh, the, the amount in our account is intended to take all of those amounts and aggregate them. Okay? Okay, so. But for somebody who is nearing retirement, that full amount is going to be there. For somebody who's just starting on their career, hardly any money is going to be there. Oh, right, right. Because they have a long, they have a long earnings uh, trail in front of them. In, in order to build up that amount, right. both from the library's contribution and their own contribution. So then, so then, 
then it's accurate to say we owe $500,000 more and it won't increase because the three, the two million we paid is the account for the 50,000 on? Yes. Okay. And if five people decided to retire, we are, we're somewhat cushioned. The danger that we had before mm -hmm. was without any funding, Yes. they would, in, in my example, they would look for that $50,000 and we wouldn't have it. Right. Think okay. of day one. We haven't had a payroll, we haven't had anything, but Absolutely. we have $900,000 of liability. So they would reach in and they'd say, okay, $50,000. Now they would look to us to make that money up so that they could put it into the retirement account. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't need additional money. It comes out of the underfunded yeah. amount every day. The other thing that you have to consider is that there are multiple items which affect our contribution rate. The second most important, right behind unfunded liability, is earnings in the fund. So if IMRF does not earn their target right. return of 7.5%, yep. what they do, uh, what IMRF does is they increase, it's an upward pressure on the, uh, on the contribution rate. Right. Okay. I'm aware of that. Last year, they only earned 0.4%. This most recent year that closed, they earned 7.71%. And are we affected by this year's 7.7? Is that the year they're going to be looking at us? Well, their target is 7.5%. So mm -hmm. they earned in excess of their target by a small amount, 0.21%. When they earn in excess of their target, it puts downward pressure on the contribution rates across the board. Right, right. So you said that we wouldn't be obligated um, we wouldn't need to be concerned about whether how much they made until was it one year after one year we're in IMRF. Then if they their rate is above seven and a half percent, it'll be to our benefit. But it's after our first year being in IMRF. No, we were we were affected to a lesser degree by by last year's earnings as well. Oh, we were. I thought we were told we wouldn't be affected because no. we were just starting. It appears in the 7.31% new rate beginning on uh, uh, January 1st, 2018. Okay. All of the, everything accumulates. All right, well that's a little different then. Okay, but that's great. All right, well thank you. Know, you. Can I ask something that piggyback? Yeah, go right ahead. So, um, are we done then with the unfunded if we pay the 500? Is there another unfunded next year that we might have? Um, as, as I was saying, if let's say IMRF only earns 1% this year, okay? What that'll do is that'll create, um, that'll create upward pressure on our rate. Now, we may not be able to pay that down uh, because it won't appear as an unfunded liability. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that aspect of it works, but what they, what they generally do is, a, uh, is adjust what's called the normal cost for an employee. So every hour that somebody works, Okay, they get 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 bucks an hour or something like that. Um, they tax us through our contribution rate, what's called a normal cost. And the earnings of the uh, fund, whether it's above 7.5 or below 7.5% per year, impacts what that normal cost is. Okay. As I understand it, what they do is they take that they take that uh, discrepancy and they amortize it. I believe it's over mm -hmm. four years, might be over five years. So last year, you know, when they only earned 0.4 percent, they were short 7.1 percent. And if they're short 7.1 percent over, I can't do the math fast mm -hmm. enough, but it's like it's going to have a, a 1.3 percent right. impact on our normal cost. Okay. How are we, uh, employees have the option of buying back service, is that option done? That option, that option, per, I'm sorry, that option uh, persists until the day before they retire. Oh. As long as they're working for us. No, but there was a, some provision if they bought it early, it cost them less? Or? The cost goes up every year by... Right. Guess what? Seven and a half percent. Okay. Ah. So, 
you know, so the major break point was for the for our employees, and and again, what's the most important date to IMRF? Twelve thirty one. The most important uh, uh, break point was for them to buy their past service before 1231, 2016. That's the cheapest that they can get it. This year, it's plus 7.5%. Sure. As a matter of fact, on January 1st, it's plus 7.5%. Uh, okay. And then it adjusts again the following January 1st. So we did have a lot of people buy back their time. I really, is, I think I think IMR was probably actually surprised by how many people did because that did not match their experience with other places. But a lot of time has been bought back. But it is always possible people might buy more. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, in, in your presentation, you mentioned um, that new employees would not be covered by an insurance by IMR. What insurance are we talking about? Short-term disability, long-term disability, okay. life insurance, accidental life. death and dismemberment. You know, some of the more pleasant things So how things long to does that take, one Please. year? Yes. So we would not cover them until they reach their IMRF quota, is that correct? Well, just the opposite. What we're trying to do is buy a policy that's complementary to uh, the uh, IMRF policy and covers employees who are not otherwise covered. For workman's comp? What were no, the not, no, not workman's comp. What were for the insurance that are not covered for? Short-term disability. Okay. Long-term disability. Life insurance. Accidental death and dismemberment. Wow. Okay, so we think we need to cover them even though IMRF doesn't for the first year. Well, it's um, it's a it's a benefit that uh, that we've had. I I feel uh, uh, unless you want to, unless you want to change you know unless you want to change the benefits configuration. I mean, you know, well, it's because up to you. it's covered by IMRF now, that's supposed to be an advantage. Remember that saving us money. We thought. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying we need to to create uh, another plan to cover them. Uh, so in past years, we paid about eighteen thousand dollars a year for this. Um, Broad-based estimates are to maintain the same benefit and to cover brand new employees who don't have experience with IMRF. Um, uh, looks to be about eight to nine thousand dollars, so about half. Per person? No, uh, in the aggregate. So then that would be another. Okay. Right now, it's in the budget at eighteen thousand dollars because I don't have any information on that yet. And these are full-time and part-time people? Uh, these are, um, are full-time people. Oh. Uh, but that also covers uh, employees who earn more than, uh, or who work more than 1,000 hours a year. Because so they're an IMRF. So 20 plus. Yeah, 19.23 hours plus. Okay. You know, I know IMRF is an incredible pension that but if we're not careful, it's just skyrocketing, especially when we consider salaries and hours at 20. You know, we thought we were going to take a hard look at our employees as you we were hiring them to try to maintain certain expenses. I don't know if we've been able to do that, but I think it may be something to give some thought to because 20 plus at 8.5%, that's like the highest raise you can imagine, and that's IMRF. Plus, They'll be getting, you know, the um, other benefits. I just, I just, I was shocked to see part timers make so much here. But all right, moving on, because I know we've got a lot of other people have questions. I had a question about programming, and somewhere in here, and I can't yeah. find it. Can I go back to your comment about the uh, breakdown of, uh, of whatever you have? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to Carolyn's uh, suggestion of seeing the uh, cost per department. Right, that's what you're one of the things. Yes. I just don't know what that will, I don't know how that would possibly affect what I, what I, I, I feel about the budget. Because I, I don't really want to go through department by department per person in each department and then, you know, try to figure out is, is it appropriate. 
position because that's you know what we're paying Susan to do. It's not necessarily money. It's to give. It, it's to have a, another set of eyes to look at the way we staff, and and just a few things that have come before this board. I know for a fact you came up with great ideas. It's like, well, really, you have these people doing this and that one doing that. What about this or that? We're not trying to tell her job, but I think because it's it's more than half our budget, it's something we should at least have the opportunity to look at. And if recommendations come out of it, that's great. But I think to blindly keep approving a budget year after year and not have a clue, that bothers me. Can you give me a comment? Well, we did have that one consultant that the board had approved that looked at all of our staff and looked at all our departments and said we were right on point. We had that other set of eyes come in completely objective. That was just years a couple. Ago. It was a couple two, years ago. Well, you know, it was, it was just two okay, years you have, ago, and right. that was a lot of money. I'm spent sure it was, but by we, the board. as a board, we should so be viewing actually, staffing regularly. I'm just saying, and I think we are, but I'm just saying that he has been done, and it was on point. And actually, they said we were right on, spot on. The only thing that they said we needed help was actually getting out to the community and doing our reach out. If I, mm -hmm. if I, well, that's not generalization, right. but anyway, the purpose. Well, there was a lot of money for a generalization, well, which right. because I did not vote for. So I'm just letting you know. Well, that was a lot of money for a generalization. Right. If you don't want to back up what you voted for. Well, right now, it, what happened two years ago is obsolete. Wow. Well, we <laughs> we so so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. obsolete in two years. It's obsolete. Right. Well, I think your staffing's changed drastically in the past two years. Who's new? We have got new people here in the past two years. And, and then, if I could just piggyback one more time on that breaking down, we do have the line items broken down from adult, juvenile, event, <coughs> team, which that does break down at least the programming piece. And then, when you go into the salaries for the different line item for the different um, on page B3, which gives you the payroll for the librarian, librarian grade. Mm -hmm. You can divide that up for all the people that actually are within those uh, departments. Excuse me, Linda, that's, that's that not time, my, my right concern. Time. And that would actually give you a pretty general idea of how much those departments are costing, if that's what you're okay. looking no, for. No, with all due respect, this is a budget that is a spreadsheet. I'm asking to look at the information that's usually created by departments in preparation of their new requests for their new year budget. And it also includes, it summarizes their previous year's budget where there are usually goals and what was accomplished and what changes should be made. It gives you a thorough idea of what's going on. And it's really helpful. I look at this budget line by line all year long, but it doesn't help me understand adult services and, and this really truly isn't the process that a department would bring to you in preparation for their budget there's more to it than that that's why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it up but thanks for pointing out I know that there's line items but it's it's not geared to each department to give me an idea of really what takes place but as far as programming goes I meant all the programs we have each department, I thought, was responsible for creating their own programming for whatever reason. Um, like, I can't even think of, uh, let's see. Well, we just had the pizza event. Um, or each, what am I, I'm thinking of something about the Golden Globes or something. I heard a lot about that. So that comes out of some department. And um, I, it used to be every year in February. So somebody is in charge of creating this. And whatever it entails, there is a, um, there's, um, a guideline that's followed either in staffing, I don't know if we buy things, if we have entertainment, and so many people attend. Again, a big issue with our programs are have we gotten to the point where we can determine how many Niles residents are now attending our events? For the past two years, that has been a stickler. Um, and I'm still hearing complaints from the taxpayers that there are more people here from other areas than from Niles. And I thought by now we were going to have some type of arrangement where we can identify the people who come to all these events. Because some of them are rather costly. And I know um, 
Susan mentioned, well, you know, we're not standing at the door. So I thought that maybe we're not standing at the door, but when they come into wherever this area is, somebody should be at least helping us. That is what we identified. We discussed. we discussed this prior, and I've made phone calls to Desplaines, Morton Grove, Skokie, um, Wilmette, Lincolnwood, all of our neighboring, Schomburg, Arlington Heights, none of them do that. That is not what a public library does. We do not stand at the door and ask who is coming to our programming. That is not what a public library does. Okay, you don't have to stand at the door, but I would think when you it's arrange to have people come to an event. I the question. Well, I'm sorry, they're in Chicago. Even Chicago, I'm well, Chicago. Sorry, they're Carolyn, Carolyn, if you want to make a proposal. But what I'd like to read to you. Well, if you want to make a proposal that we do that, I then did. we should. Well, then we. I think we, we discussed it as a board, and we they voted on it. And the reason. So I, you want to read. Propose it, you can do that. Okay, I will in a second. The reason I find that that is important is because according to this Illinois state statute, which I know were not included in creating our budget, it says here the library board may adopt in order to render the use of the library of the greatest benefit to the greatest number greatest number of residents and taxpayers. So what that means is we do need to be aware of who's coming to these events because the greatest number of our expenses are to be for all the residents and taxpayers of Niles, not just anyone. And when we brought this up before, I said, of course, anyone can borrow a book, anyone can borrow a video. I'm talking about entertainment giveaways. And if we're not bringing in the majority of the people coming here aren't from Niles, then we need to rethink. Are we not attracting them? Let's rethink what we're doing. That's what programming is. That's how, that's why we may want to have eyes on some of the reports. I'm sure they generate reports about the uh, results of these different events they have because that's how they would plan for next year, would be my thought. That's valuable information. Well, why don't we put that on agenda item? I'd love to. Actually, well, Tim, isn't that part of our strategic plan? Well, I, what I'm trying to say is let's let's finish up with the budget, then let's address that issue at a separate meeting, and okay. then bring up your reasons, make a proposal, and we'll discuss it as a board, and we'll take a vote on it. Well, that's my point. It, it, it's okay. used to already create a budget. But that's, we but don't have that information for this budget. So well, we can't it, it, do that for this I, budget. You go ahead. Yeah, um, I just want to point out that um, we do keep an eye on our programs. I, of course, you uh, in every board packet get the statistics of all the programs that have been held the previous month by name, so you know what the attendance was, mm -hmm. and you know um, you have a good idea of what the library is offering. We very often, a great part of my director's report is talking about the programs that have been held and the accounts of it, and you get pictures, and you have a lot of information about that. I will say that the particular program that you're talking about, which was the Oscar program, um, we took a closer look at after you had mentioned it, particularly last year. We and we had kept our eye on it before because we knew it was one of our more fancy, extra, you know, not extravagant, but uh, it was a big deal. It was a big event, and so we kept a close eye on the costs this year. And we have, in fact, told the librarian that we're not going to be able to do it again next year because looking at it overall, the cost per person was too high. So, but I do consider that to be our job. Um, I do my job. That's, I do my job diligently, and you have hired me to do that job. So either you trust the work that I'm doing or you don't trust the work that I'm doing, but I do pay attention to the cost. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention is that, in my opinion, we do benefit the greatest number of taxpayers by keeping our programs as open as possible so that other libraries' programs are open to our patrons. We have many libraries surrounding us. We all share those program resources. I, I would agree with that. I, I plan to attend a couple of programs at Park Ridge because they have programs that I actually learned about when I was here at a library event here at Niles. And I'd hate to be told I can't come in because I don't live within the Park Ridge. Well, you may just pay a fee depending on where you go. Um, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. But There's some places I heard are charging. But just back to your report that is in our budget every month. Mm -hmm. It tells us two people came, three people came. I'm not just looking for that. I'm looking for an overall report from a department head who says, guess what, we did this this month and this was it. 
who came, what you bought, what it cost. I mean, what, what it involved. I mean, that's what I call programming and how we would know how we're spending our money. It's one of the, the, one of the biggest things in the library are our events. So that's what I meant by that. Well, then, again, I suggest we don't have that information for this budget. Okay. So then moving forward for next year, let's make Thank you. proposals Sounds and great. let's discuss it and let's decide it. Okay, and then I had another point about passports. I noticed there's a $25,000 line item. I didn't realize that we needed a $25,000 upfront cost. It's revenue. It's in the revenue budget. It's revenue? Is that where it is? Okay. So we plan on making $25,000? Are anticipating it. It's our estimate. Yeah. Explained it was explained. Okay. Meeting. No, I know. I thought it was a cost, and I was wondering. I, I knew you needed it this. Though. I think it was a line item for ten thousand cost. Mm -hmm. Eleven. We, ex it? we expect to do one thousand passports according to the document that was submitted to the board last uh, mm -hmm. last meeting. The uh, the revenue is twenty five dollars per passport application. Right. So that's how we get to twenty five thousand. The actual cost associated with it. Um, initially, we're going to do it on a reactive basis, and we're going to fund it out of current staff that are working. Uh, right. As long as they don't get too busy, we're not, we don't plan mm -hmm. to have the passport desk constantly managed. But if we do, it could cost as much as ten thousand dollars. And the way that we calculated ten thousand dollars is that we took a quarter of an hour times. Mm -hmm. That's right. Times uh, an average. Yes, I heard that. We were hoping it'll take 15 minutes to create or to process a passport. Like I said, my concern was it said I thought it was a $25,000 line item for upfront costs. No, that's right. Great, thank you. Um, and then I have one last question: professional development for staff. I think is it 48,000 this year. Is it because something expensive is happening? Because I think it was just wanting about that. Recently. I know because it's PLA this year. I know. So my question is, it was only twenty-two thousand last year, or about that much. So wherever we're going, it costs more. Is that why it's forty-eight thousand? That, that particular conference is every other year. So this was an off year. Next year is an on year. Okay. So is it the cost, or do more people go to this? Is that why it's more expensive? I'm just trying to determine. I mean, why. it's it's not. I mean, it, it didn't exist this year, so nobody went to it. So next year they will yeah. be going to it. Yeah, it's in every odd other years, year. In odd years, okay. it's zero attendance. So and, okay, and so that we consider that professional development. I noticed also in here that um, you're going to have um, looks like. Harwood Institute is going to be providing staff training. Yes, I have, did put that in the, as part of the staff development part of the strategic plan. Um, I think that 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 and that is accounted for in the professional and what development would the Harvard as well. Harwood Institute be providing like what type yes. of professional development? It, it, the professional it, the type of training that it is is about talking with members of the community and how to best develop ongoing relationships. It's a whole program. I'd be happy to send you the website so you can take a look. Well, no, I'm just, I was wondering what this cost was in, in relation to the 48,000 to go to Philadelphia or wherever. Well, I mean, the, the professional development includes a lot of different things. It's the webinars, it's every program that anybody would go to. It's the local programs as well as the national ones, but, uh, but PLA is the one time that we send people out nationally. So oh, is Harvard around this much, 48,000 for everyone? Because you're going to have all your staff? No, no, no. It, it would be, um, I don't, I, I think the cost for doing it virtually was, was it 600 a person? Yeah, I think so. And yeah, so, yeah, but I want to have enough staff trained that it, we get critical mass. Um, so we accounted for that this year as well. Okay, I guess what I'm, what, what I'm getting at is it seems like that there are just so many increases trying to get our staff on board with whatever direction we're going in. Um, but I would like to see us pay more attention to IMRF and part-timers. Because I think we could save money if we could rethink the way we staff. At least give us an opportunity to view that. Well, as I said, we are not hiring people at 20 hours. We're hiring people under the IMRF level. So we already made that choice. Okay, but I would still love to see some information by the departments, and if we can get that on the agenda, and maybe it'll happen this time, that would be great. That's all I have. Thank you. Kenny? 
uh, Greg. I had quite a few questions. They've been answered from everybody else's questions. Plus, thank you very much. Okay, I have a few questions, Greg. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, B2. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this may have been answered, so pardon me, miscellaneous. So, um, miscellaneous in uh, 1617 includes a couple of items. Um, uh, the biggest item that it includes is the, uh, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it was about $24,000 or $25,000 from the book sale that we had warehoused on our, on our books and ultimately decided to keep it for ourselves. Plus about thirteen dollars to $1,400 a month uh, after that point. As, as so we have a sales? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that most was my of it question, because yeah. I was wondering actually, that was another one of my questions, so the piggy banks, because I'm wondering, was that, or where is the book sale money? That, yeah. was, that was my next I question. Don't I don't have it. <laughs> so, okay. All right, so that answers two of my questions. Okay, so now it's a line item, because that is what we discussed. Did mm -hmm. put that mm -hmm. on line item? That's correct. So that is it. Thank you. Uh, OC, LC, uh, oh no, actually B3 is my next point, my next question. For these salaries, you said you have a 3% kind of... Um, it's a 3% program for the year. Okay. okay, so my question is, if we decide to stray from that in any way, decide to do an adjusted or a merit pay type schedule or bonuses like I mean um, is there like some wiggle room if we decide to do something other than the three percent that we've done in the past or well, how does that work? Okay so three percent um, uh, in terms of dollars mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. year to this year it looks like about forty eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And if you Reduce it to how much per percentage percentage point of raise? Mm -hmm. It's sixteen thousand. So if you did a one percent raise right. year okay. over year, it'd be sixteen thirty-two for two, etc. Um, if you wanted to uh, bifurcate the uh, the raise into uh, into a merit and I guess uh, a base. A base. That's what I was thinking of it as, yeah. You know, if you know, if you did like two for the base and one for the merit. What that would do is, in uh, budgetary terms, that would provide uh, thirty-two thousand dollars plus sixteen. You're still at three percent because two okay. in one is three, right? right? So for a total of forty-eight thousand dollars, if you wanted, would it be a little wiggle room? Well, a little bit. Yeah. well I'm not exactly. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm not following your question. Well, I'm. I'm just wondering. Like, is if we pass this budget, yeah, when, whatever date we decide as a board. Is it automatically like if there's a 3% increase, everyone gets a 3% increase? No. Well, that's what we've or is it something that we still have a discussion and we can still change it if, well, if board decides? Yeah, one of the things that we've done in the past, mm -hmm. or most the thing that we've done in the past, is once we've decided on a, on a raised program, everybody got it. Mm, right. Um, what is, uh, at Susan's mind, if I could speak for you, uh, is that we do a base and and a uh, and a merit piece, and she would have full discretion on the merit piece. Okay. Um, now, what you know, what we would have to do is figure out how to account for that. But the way it would break up in terms of dollars, basically, is that she would have about fifteen thousand, sixteen thousand uh, dollars to award in raises uh, just based on merit. Is so it, that's is still it? not yeah. So it's still a decision to be made. Is yes. it? That's my question. Yeah. So yes. I think you have. So I think you have two decisions to make. Okay. Mm -hmm. The one, the first decision is is three <coughs> percent where you want to be. You know, is it two percent or is it four percent or is it three percent? Mm -hmm. And then once you decide on that, I think you have to decide whether or not you want to break it into a base and a merit. You know, beyond that. Okay, and, and then we could, you know, then the decision would be, you know, is it two and one or one and a half and one and a half or, you know, some other, you know, some other combination, you know, assuming that 3% is a good number. Excuse me, go ahead, Patty, yeah. yeah. Um, usually, when we decide to raise the base, we decide to raise it based on the 
after we passed a budget, we talked about that like in exactly. July or August, isn't it? No, we talked about the. It's pretty much was. Because start with that races would start as of July one, so I oh, have to so have that information for be, that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, you do have the May meeting where you could discuss it further, or um, or even as far as the June. Would that be okay? I was for some reason in the back of my mind, I was thinking that came. Yeah, it was pretty much kind of cut and dry. That's what it was. Okay. That's um, good to know. Okay. So then, if so, then my question, I guess, just to add to it, so if. If we did the base and then um, the merit, or what do you call it? Yeah, base and the uh, merit. Base okay. merit. Um, then if we wanted to do, like, um, so that would be considered like bonuses, or? So that would, you, that would be, still just be the raise based for each on your, Based on your yes. But if you okay. did bonuses, that would, I think you have that in the adjustments line, yeah. is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I, I, we traditionally put an amount in the adjustment line to account for you know, bonuses that the board may feel are. Uh, appropriate well, to award. A bonus is one time a year, and the raise program is uh, evergreen. Mm -hmm. So you know, if uh, if we do a base and a an American, it's a two and a one, mm -hmm. um, uh, and the raises you know come through, and the raise comes through at let's say three and a half percent. Okay, that three and a half percent is added to the base against paid, and becomes the base for next year. So, so some people can make three per three and a half percent, some people can make two and a half, yeah. it just depends on, so it's, okay. So right. their raise for the following year, if I'm understanding you right, is based on the, is based on the base and not yeah. the base plus the merit. No, it's, it's based on base plus merit. Okay. Yeah, it's different from the schools, it just, it would be, yeah. you know, you would get whatever your raise was for the year and that would accumulate then the next year your salary would have gone up by that amount mm -hmm. okay. it's not a bonus okay okay and then because uh, i'm not an accountant yeah. what is it what is it called when you remember we have the you know you have what your budget is but then you go up to a certain amount what is that appropriation appropriations yeah okay so your appropriations so there's no appropriations on the salary part well, yes, there is. Um, actually, if you look in the last tab, um, you know yeah, what that's I. That's what I'm trying. That's what I'm missing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. That's, okay. Yeah. So there's some wiggle room. I'm not saying go double. I'm, not saying, I'm just saying you've got. But I mean, there is some wiggle room there, so that we, so there could be bonuses or. Yeah. Okay. So, so look at it this way. I just don't want to increase it if we don't have to, as long as the appropriations is where there gives us that. Yes. Okay. Look, if I may, look at it this way: the the budget mm -hmm. is the administration's contract with the board. Right. The appropriation is the board's contract with the state. They, okay. Really so nice. it's a legal limit that you can go up to uh, if if you desire. That's why we were okay making the two million dollar. Uh, uh, payment to IMRF to pay down our unfunded liability because we had it in the appropriation last year yeah. and we put it in there just for that purpose. Right, right, okay. I, have, I was just kind of missing this page or something. Okay, that, that makes my, um, makes me understand a more. Okay, so, um, B4, the OCLC line. Yep. Remind me why it, is it, is it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's money that goes, it's through CCS, and it's uh, calculated, it's just, yeah, I don't know if it's always broken out separately, but it's done according to, it's CCS is the one that does the calculations, right. because it's all through their plan, and it has to do with um, the amount of money that we have budgeted for materials. So I'm whenever sorry. you budget more for materials, than that OCLC charge because it's for, it's called county catalog the, because records. Because it's the actual um, the inter the interlibrary loan. It's it's the catalog. Oh, the catalog. It's for entering the interlibrary loan. Is that loan. correct, Victoria? Yeah. Am I explaining that correctly? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So this is the cataloging, getting the records from um, it's the money. It's, it's not the interlibrary loan. It's entering our catalog records. Ah. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. I was getting that a little bit mixed up. Yeah, no, that's not nothing with interlibrary loan. Ah, okay. It's just creating our credit for clarifying that for me. That makes sense. Okay. And the volunteer line item went up. Mm -hmm. Did you, Cindy? Um, it actually um, the software expense for the volunteer um, management program is in this line. This year, it used to be part of um, the IT budget, but to be able to track all the volunteer expenses, it's now here. Okay, because I'm thinking, okay, we're going to like double for the volunteers. This is just kind of a counter, you know. Yeah, we're here. I was like, what? That I am from one line to another. They're very good about like, volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Like, hmm, interesting. So, okay, well, that makes sense. So, thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, I think everything else, professional development answer, legal fact, fees going down, consultants going down, if they're all that's great. I think actually those are my last two questions. Um, and everything else that I have questions, I was concerned about the outside steel structure, so I appreciate that that's in with the building site because that is really needs to get done. Uh, yes, it does. And See the only building site that makes it possible. Minor kids they sign. Kids space. Yeah, they get well. It's just like a every time I walk in, I'm like, please fix that. <laughs> I'm <laughs> writing a note. <laughs> well, Dave and I have been exploring uh, uh, different options in terms. I mean, of so I would think that maybe it's just not working and you. Um, but it really, I mean, majorly is the outside steel structure. I was, I was yes. in there. Um, I think that's everything for me, so thank you so much. Now that you mentioned buildings, that was the one thing. You had said about the special reserve for, for buildings. Oh, well, special was, reserve for larger projects. Well, yeah. But that one that is down need, should be considered being built up. It, how would we build it up? What would, where would that come from? Well, that would come from general fund, uh, uh, general fund fund balance. So that's in here. Figure it out, or no? Is that something we vote on later? How is do we figure we, that? We're talking about special re reserve, or special, special reserve. revenue, special reserve. Because I'm not sure if you. Yeah, the say one it, he was talking at the beginning of his mm -hmm. slides, and I thought about it, but I forgot to write it down. And so, you were talking that that was the one fund that you thought we might want. We might want to the building to. site. One from the special revenue. Yeah. Okay. So the building and site fund at the end of the building and site fund at the end of this year, it's a special revenue fund. Mm -hmm. It'll have a deficit mm -hmm. of about ninety-eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And what we're planning on doing is making a bigger allocation of the tax levy toward that fund to pay off the deficit and to fund this year's activities. So the money will be there to cover yeah. that? Okay. That's all I was talking Yeah, and you know, and, and you can look at it this way. Right now, uh, the building and site fund owes the general fund ninety-eight thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. And then when we start to get tax revenue in, you know, it'll it'll get paid off. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now that everyone spoke on do you have any more questions, Karen? I just have one for you. Okay. Um, since you had um, public comments in the beginning, and I know the oh, people sitting here, yes. now they've yes. heard the budget, yeah, let's and do we have it again? Yes, okay. of course. So, um, would anybody like to speak for public comments? Okay, no one's no, no, interested in okay, speaking. Thank okay. you. So, <laughs> Well, yeah, we put the tentative ordinance on the agenda in case you wanted to vote for it tonight, but you do not have to vote for it tonight. You can kick that to the May meeting. It's up to you. We should May probably kick it to the May meeting. We have our other two board members on the board. They can ask board. their questions. Sure. Yes. I think that's only mm -hmm. fair. fair. I think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Meeting adjourned? Yes. So May we go around the table and take a vote? Yes. Um, I 
Is there someone who made that motion? Oh, a motion. Oh, a motion to. <laughs> motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Um, I'll make it. Yanni Zen. Okay. So, um, Patty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Linda. Yes. Karen. Yes. Tim. Yes. And Carolyn. Yes. Thank you very much.